Welcome to another instalment in our festive series of podcasts offering listening during the holidays and keeping curious minds well fed in an arbitrary fashion. Here, I speak with Bobby Savarese, Senior Principal and Business Development Director at Unispace Life Sciences, about how laboratory space requirements have changed since the pandemic. With Pharma 4.0, a new trend now being broadly talked about, we explore the results of the company's recent research report, Forefront, and talk about design and build services with quantum computing in the lab space sector. A close look indeed at this part of the industry, this informative episode on the laboratory space side of things, should offer a different bit of listening this holiday season. Thank you for tuning in. This is web editor Nicole Raleigh, and today I have with me Bobby Sabarese, Senior Principal and Business Development Director at Unispace Life Sciences. And today we'll be discussing how laboratory space requirements have changed since the pandemic. Welcome, Bobby. Thank you, Nicole. It's great to be here. So before we get into that, I just wondered if you could perhaps tell listeners more about your journey to what you do today, Bobby. Well, uh, very interesting question and legitimate. I believe that the journey starts with um, Unispace making a firm commitment to investing in the life science sector and fundamentally creating a second core business, which is very focused on uh, delivering a bolt on design and construction for office space, of course, uh, which is fundamentally their forte. Uh, lab, lab spaces, RD centers, clean room. Uh, I would actually say more generally speaking, what we look to accomplish in Unispace Life Sciences is everything that's associated from a sterile aseptic environment and not only limited to life science spaces and biotechnology, but also what I would call the high-tech industry. And was this a passion for you from not year dot, but from childhood, this life sciences fascination? I think the fascination starts, you are correct, maybe not childhood, because, you know, we dream of maybe becoming uh, astronauts or, you know, a, uh, a, a some kind of airline pilot. You know, we, we all have dreams and mm -hmm. I respect all the dreams of, of young children, but they kind of then mature and develop as your academic processes put into play. Uh, not only a knowledge base, but also what clicks with you, what what creates a passion for you. And what clicked for me is being able to enter in the world of healthcare, but from a scientific perspective. And I think I found the association of applied engineering to bring the, let's say, the the conditions in which pharmaceuticals or, and we deliver pharmaceuticals in two different forms, right? Small molecules that go into a pill form or a capsule form, and then large molecules that are much more serious that are, that are delivered intravenously. And there were many, many challenges from a engineering point of view. And that really captured my attention and my passion to associate engineering and delivery uh, to make these environments better, safer. And of course, the condition is to be able to produce the drugs that the world needed. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So I want to focus now on Unispace's latest research report, Forefront. And that report revealed six areas of focus for top global pharmaceutical firms, sustainability, equipment recapitalization and digitalization came out as the top areas. And these findings were a result of surveying 180 global industry leaders interviewing 12 blue chip pharma companies and learning from a round table hosted by the International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering or ISPE in order to understand topics unique to pharmaceutical engineering teams. Now, I know you weren't an author of the report, Bobby, but perhaps you could provide corporate commentary on these findings. I'm very happy to do so. And I, I'm legitimizing uh, that what I'm sharing is indeed my point of view, but it does capture and represent the corporate point of view. Mm -hmm. All in all, it's a great piece of reporting. It was developed by uh, my colleague, Ashlyn Crawley, who did a wonderful job of assembling both the analytical strategic marketing, as well as the those pockets of demographics that you need to, to be able to have access to so that you can define the numbers. And I believe that uh, this is a 
well-developed report that shows the global benchmarking in life sciences and biotech. Um, it obviously identifies the best practices that are uh, currently with the big, what we call blue chip big pharma. Also, the trends uh, of where this pharma is 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 tending to go in the future. The insight and unique topics such as engineering and research teams readapting their primary goals within the pharma biotech industry. And most importantly, this Kodak moment, this snapshot was taken in a post-pandemic timeframe. So Mm -hmm. it was done in 2021 onward. And we think that that is meaningful because what happened during and after COVID sets the new trend of how to develop and repatriate capital uh, within certain regions of the world. And and um, and that's exactly what we wanted to touch base. The report actually touches base, as you mentioned, Nicole, in six uh, areas, which are very, very important to our industry, organizational restructuring, uh, the sustainability, as I said in um, my, my previous uh, expose, uh, I think it's very important on all industries, in particular in the pharma biotech industry, Pharma 4.0 is a new trend that's that's actually right now being broadly talked about. We needed to be involved in that discussion. Engineering recapitalization, very important topic. Um, I'm sure that we will continue to hear the evolution of this. Digital integration, which means also digital uh, digital and digitization. And last but not least, uh, maintenance from a just-in-time perspective. I do invite the audience if they do have the opportunity to have a look at the forefront report. Yes, and I would second that. I mean, if we look at the results for sustainability goals to date, more than half, that is 56% of global pharmaceutical companies have formal sustainability goals and they're putting these processes in place to deliver on the metrics. I mean, as the report states, nearly two thirds or 60% of Respondents have or will have a sustainability budget, and 25% apparently said that they are adding a dedicated sustainability role at corporate and at site levels to help meet those goals. So did you want to comment on that, Bobby? Yes, uh, actually, I do. It, it, very true, the 56% uh, of the respondents have a sustainability goal. These translate to clear implementation objectives within a given time frame. It entails that sustainability starts from the top. So therefore, it starts from their leadership. And then the commitment uh, actually evolves into a pathway of being able to target a total carbon neutrality within a given time frame. And um, that is very, very important to the, to the pharma and biotechnology industry. Uh, the criterias are rather interesting. Um, they... You know, finding the right way of reducing carbon and greenhouse gases is always a bit of a challenge. But I would say that three key areas of interest that we will see evoluting within this industry will be, in fact, uh, reducing the carbon footprint by reducing greenhouse gases and, and emissions, conservation of water, and designing green buildings. And I would leave it at that because I think if we peel back the onion to talk more about it, we'd be here uh, taking over the entire the entire time allotment of the podcast. No worries at all. Um, It's all good information for listeners. So now I want to talk about Future Lab. What is Unispace trying to accomplish with that? So Future Lab is trying to set the uh, pace for what we consider the next generation laboratory. Uh, for various environments. Of course, um, you know, what stands out for us is the life science and biotech business. But along with that, there are many, many other sectors that require lab and lab testing. Future Lab uh, is taking into account uh, what are the critical technologies uh, that need to now become an integral part of the laboratory. I'll just name a few. Uh, LIMS are also known as Lab Information Management Systems, uh, digital twin technology that's been around for a while. Of course, everyone knows about the common buzz around uh, applied AI technology within the lab. Very important for us remains the biosafety and cyber safety of a laboratory. And what we think unifies these technologies and progresses towards 
uh, the ultimate achievement, which is to accelerate the R&D project cycle and achieve a faster reliance and recognition, especially for new drug approval, is the quantum computer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we think about the hosting of quantum computing, how is the next generation of labs designed so that it can meet the requirements for such new advanced technology? Critical to understand uh, for the listeners that uh, quantum computing in laboratories are in reality not that far away. We know because uh, we've developed already a few. And I think for today's podcast, what I'd like to speak about is in our arena of uh, design and build services, what does that entail? Obviously, quantum computer can be pretty complex machinery. I think the most important critical learning that we have from our experience is the heat that's generated by a quantum computer. The most important need in any environment is when you have excess heat or what we call a, you know, a big disparity in delta T, you have to stabilize the laboratory temperature. And also to make sure that the quantum computer is working functionally, you have to be able to, to uh, render that environment cool to a certain what we call spec temperature. So in order to do that, there is some complex engineering that gets applied. Um, there is verification of what we need to do from a, a cooling system. This usually translates itself into cooling circuits. Specifically, what we do is we do a, a calculation. We introduce some, some chillers, and there's a distribution system of bringing a constant temperature through chilled water, uh, and, and the chilled water has to have a certain flow rate around the structure, not contained into the quantum computer, but around the quantum computing supporting structure. Quantum computers are at that very sophisticated. They're, therefore, they need a specific environment, which is a clean room uh, facility that goes around, uh, around the quantum computing. Um, we also know that we need to have a static dissipative flooring with uh, some interesting industrial gases and uh, some of the architectural features in the future will be a little bit challenged because we all know that our standard uh, floor to ceiling height is usually at the level of the false ceiling about three meters and that will probably be challenged we'll be innovative in which create the environment within an arch architectural and engineering structure that we know but will make it adaptable to be able to host a quantum computer Gosh, so we are talking about a, a fair amount of space. So if we think about uh, flexibility of the resource of space or shared services, for example, concierge service, how can this help to optimize lab space requirements for Big Pharma? Well, uh, that's one of our key goals. So Future Lab uh, as a product is also trying to generate uh, a reduced a space allocation from the, uh, let's say, world-renowned or global-renowned best-in-class, which we understand it to be at eight square meters per, per R&D specialist. We're trying to bring that number down to six meters per R&D specialist. Uh, why do we say that uh, we believe strongly that we can achieve that? For a fair amount of reasons. The first uh, one is that the introduction of optimized, flexible uh, space allocation is is very much at the forefront of these labs. It doesn't start only with Future Lab. Of course, there's a bit of history. Uh, smart labs and flexi labs that have been around for a while, um, and open ballroom concepts. But more importantly, integrating technologies and making sure that these these technologies are assimilated in useful. We would call them collaborative collision courses so that um, you can uh, attain, like you rightfully mentioned, uh, Nicole, these, um, these spaces would probably uh, take into account what we call concierge service delivery. Um, you know, if you, if you give the attribute and to a scientist to be able to handle everything that he needs, he would bring everything on his lab bench, right? Everything from PPE gear to a clean glassware, it gets mixed up with the dirty glassware and also the chemicals that probably are needed or primary pharma ingredients that are needed for his experiments. What we're trying to do is concierge that and be able to mm -hmm. render it, you know, through an easy process of 10, 15 minute delivery. Uh, it also needs to be regulated because some of this stuff, it is, they are hazardous. They can be flammable, so they need to be guarded in safe, in safe areas. 
And then uh, these technology areas, instead of uh, making sure that everyone gets a quantum computing piece of laboratory equipment, we'd like to do them in an open space environment. So where the actual, where the actual experiment, the science is happening, then gets translated into a common open space a collaborative uh, recording of the experiment and of, of the information. We think the evolution of the lab will make us see the, the, that the new era will be able to reduce the space, but more importantly, it will make it much more efficient and socially engaged. Mm-hmm. So we're really talking about smart design. So if we think about it overall, all this um, very practical consideration, really, in the era in which we're living, How can this help accelerate the R&D project cycle um, with thoughts towards speed, efficacy and reliance and recognition for drug discovery? So that's a great question. And I appreciate you asking that. So uh, if we've learned from the post-COVID era, we learned that the sophisticated elements of being able to improve a new drug discovery starts with the technologies that are applied. Of course, we've all heard about cell and gene therapy or what we call personalized medicines. But I think in COVID and in the pandemic era, we we learned and we all heard about the mRNA technology. This process of being able to uh, target a certain spike on a cell and say, that's the nasty spike. That's the one that that makes the illness really critical. If we can only target that spike and kind of kick it off that cell, we would render this uh, this this pandemic, this disease, obviously less uh, dramatic and less dangerous. And that's exactly what mRNA did. So where the silver lining is around that is we now understand that in efficacy, in in ordinary times, that mRNA vaccine would probably have taken eight to 10 years. And because of the criticality of the need that was created by the pandemic, we all put on our thinking caps and we resolved it under emergency need, but it was resolved in months, not in years. So just saying and do that, rely on technologies that are more prone to an mRNA or abilitated around cell and gene, but be able to render ourselves within the regime of the regulators and get to a faster reliance and recognition. Where's the magic happens? We have to create this harmony of being able to bring into the same environment the regulator, the R&D scientist, along with the formulators, which are the engineers of pharma ingredients and the go-to-market specialists, to talk to one another, to have access to the data, to be able to visualize it and be able to maybe even render it paperless. And that's another goal of Future Lab. So all this is the creation of this collaborative collision course of getting everyone to, to talk to one another and on the same page so that we can get to a faster new drug approval for many, many of the terrible diseases that are out there. Thank you, Bobby. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Happy to have been here and had a chat. And so that concludes another episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find out more information about this episode, including a download link and information about previous installments of the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcasts. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher, and Podbean, where you can find and subscribe by searching the Pharma Forum. Of course, don't forget to visit our website itself, where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins, and follow us on Twitter, or X nowadays, at at PharmaForum. That's all for now. Thank you for listening.